Uh, so welcome to Looking Inside the Knowledge Library Knowledge Vault. I am here in our San Mateo office with my colleague Bruce Washburn, and we are joined by Jeff Mixter, who's in Dublin, Ohio. Bruce and Jeff will introduce the concept of the Library Knowledge Vault and look at the flow of entities and statements from bibliographic sources and how they mesh with uh, entities and, and statements from other sources, borrowing a page from Google's book. So Bruce, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay, thanks, Mary Lee, and, and hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, as the series suggests, works in progress, that's definitely what we're going to be talking about, the work that Jeff and I and others at OCLC have been pursuing is in an informative stage. It's an early stage. It's a good stage to get your feedback and guidance and direction and questions. So we're hoping to have this be as interactive a discussion as as we can make it in WebEx. So as a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today, I'll be talking some about uh, research work that's happening at Google, the Google Knowledge Vault. And I'll get into more detail what's behind that work, but we'll also want to consider how that work could apply to our work with library data, with bibliographic and authority file data. Um, OCLC has been working with that data for 40 years, but in recent years have been looking at it from a different perspective, looking at the entities that are described, the people, groups, and places, and the knowledge vault work that we're considering um, as, a, as it applies to library data is, uh, is centered on that linked data entity work. We'll, we built a little application. We call it Entity JS. That's just an internal name for it, but it's a discovery app for looking through that library knowledge vault data. We'll give a quick demonstration of what that looks like and summarize where our experiment has led us and where we're headed next. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the knowledge graph as it appears in, in Google. This was uh, an effort that they described a couple of years ago where they're trying to make connections and the relationships between things, people, places uh, that are found in various web content that Google uh, finds and crawls off the web. In their index, this would just be a, a cobweb of connections unless they could put some order to it. And we're starting to see some evidence of that uh, in their knowledge graph in those familiar knowledge panels that show up in Google search results. These represent something that I think many of us aspire to be a part of. We'd like to see, for example, if you're seeing a book in a knowledge panel, it would be helpful to see whether your library holds it, that this personalization that's built into the knowledge graph and the application, that would be, that's, that's powerful, that's interesting, that's useful, and we're trying to find ways to to deliver that kind of value to the network. Um, but related to this work only slightly at this point is experimental work at, at Google around something that they've called the Knowledge Vault. This is a way to really get highly scalable assessments of the statements that they found on the web. Conflicting claims about factual information I think you need to sift through and give some order to and some, it isn't just the number of statements that gives something prominence, it's the truth, the, the validity, the trustworthiness of the source. And they're trying to assess that through some research work that they put together to create a highly scalable, probabilistic engine for, for assessing truth from many different competing sources. There are a series of research papers, the links are shown on this slide, and the slides will be available after the presentation, but uh, Mary Lee might post to the chat one of the papers, the one that got us started thinking about this, the paper called Knowledge Vault, a Web Scale Approach to Probabilistic Knowledge Fusion. That got research folks here at OCLC thinking about how this work might apply to library data. But the whole series is pretty fascinating, and at some point might be more of a, the foundation for the, the knowledge graph that Google uh, makes available now. And um, as, as Marilee mentioned, we'd be happy to take questions as we go along, uh, sent to us via chat. 
And one of the questions I, I would have if I was listening to this presentation is, what's a triple? Because we're going to use the word triple a lot when we talk about our work. Um, so a quick overview, a triple, when we talk about it, it's a statement that relates one thing to another. And by convention, it's in the order of a subject, a predicate, and an object. RDF, the Resource Description Framework, is a way to model data, and RDF triples still have that subject, predicate, object pattern, but they'll use an identifier or a URI for those three elements. So in this example that I'm showing, there's an RDF triple with a, a VIAF identifier, a schema.org identifier for the predicate, and a fast ID for the object. But the meaning of this triple is that Barack Obama was born in Honolulu. The, the an important quality of these RDF triples, those URIs, is that they are dereferenceable. That's an, it's essential for interoperability that I'd be able to take this identifier and look up more information about it and do this in a language independent way. So the VIAF identifier, I, I represented with the string Barack Obama, but it would be, there are many different strings that might represent that one person and many other properties associated with them that could be found through that through that one lookup. So anyway, triples, it'll come up again and again. So I'd like to now wade into a brief description of the, as, as I see it, the Google Knowledge Vault work. This is complex, involved, deeply uh, thought through research work, so I have only a very superficial rendering to offer here, but there are three main components of the Google Knowledge Vault work that I think are, are interesting to highlight. The first is extractors. They're crawling many, many different sources on the web, and these extractor systems extract triples from just a huge number of web sources. Uh, when they do this, each extractor that they, they uh, produce, they assign a confidence score to the extracted triple it represents the uncertainty about the identity of the relation and its corresponding argument. So they're getting a sense of, from the source, what, what, and going in, what kind of confidence they have in the trustworthiness of the, of the factual claim in that extractor. The second main component of the knowledge vault, uh, Google researchers refer to these as graph-based priors. So they have knowledge bases. They're trying to build a knowledge vault that will be highly scalable, much larger than any single knowledge base. But if you can imagine what they had in Freebase and Wikidata and other sources, each one of those representing a knowledge base, the graph-based priors, these are systems that learn the prior probability of each triple uh, being, and its uncertainty, but they look it up in a knowledge base. Does, do we know something about this already? Do we get um, do we get a sense of how what conventional wisdom is about this triple? That's the sense of you know putting it into context of what we already know. So knowledge grows over time, knowledge bases grow over time, and many different knowledge bases might have in fact conflicting claims. So you could you could bring that in. That's just more data to to include in the calculation. So we've got extractors. We have graph-based priors. So what do you do with all this data? The next step is fusion, knowledge fusion. That's, the, that's where the math really enters into the equation. So you have properties associated with each of these triples, and you need to make some sense of it and come up with your determination of what is the most likely, the most certainty you have about a factual claim when there are many competing sources. So the fusion system computes that probability of a triple being true based on the uh, agreement between different extractors and graph-based priors. Sounds simple enough. So just thinking back to that earlier triple example where I talked about the, uh, the triple example was President Barack Obama was born in Honolulu. So if you think of it from Google's perspective, they have many different sources that they're working with. And they may find a source that says Barack Obama was born in Kenya. And maybe that's because the extractor is getting information that was actually about his father. Or maybe it's a site that's make, making a factually incorrect claim. So prior information about that, that entity in a knowledge base can be useful in helping determining 
uh, what's the uncertainty in this new claim that's been made. It could be that a knowledge base uh, does it can better inform the data they've, they've retrieved. They might find from some source the name of the person, but without a birthplace, but they have in a knowledge base a way to, to supplement their data, to add more, more properties to that, to that name. So, so this is all sort of the evolution, these three phases, they kind of work together. They're not really a, uh, it isn't quite a stepwise as I've depicted it here. So you get all the states together and at the last step you can, you can attempt to fuse it together. So apologies for my rapid tr uh, transit through, through that uh, very high level view of the, the Google Vault work. I think it's fascinating. Uh, paper is well worth looking at and if any of you have already been looking at it and, and have things to tell us about how you think it applies to, to our world, that would be really helpful for us to hear more about. Then the next step, I'm going to hand the, the baton to, to my colleague, Jeff Mixter. Jeff and I are working with others at OCLC on this, and Jeff, Jeff's looking at the same kinds of questions from a software engineering perspective. How would this work that Google has done, how might it apply to the, the data that we are more familiar with working with in the, in the library world? So, uh, Jeff, do you want to take it from here? Thanks, Bruce. So um, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, if anyone has any questions throughout the, this portion of the presentation, please feel free to um, either send chats um, or, or if you have the ability to sort of uh, cut in and ask. Um, so over the past few slides, Bruce went over sort of the high level, what is this uh, Google, Google Knowledge Vault? How does it work? How are they, um, uh, how are they using it? Um, so what I'm gonna look at now is how we can take that research and apply it to uh, library data. So over the past few months, uh, OCLC research scientists and software engineers have been evaluating how we can adapt that Google Knowledge Vault model into, uh, the, into the library domain. So what we're hoping to do is, um, starting with data sources that we have uh, internally, uh, build extractors, create priors, and then build fusers to create this, uh, this sort of knowledge vault of library bibliographic data that we could then use for sort of next generation applications and services. So you can uh, go to the next slide, please. So uh, the current sources that we have are uh, worldcat.org. Uh, that includes both the worldcat.org data as well as the works data that we, uh, that we released last year. Um, VOF as well as FAST. And those um, VOF um, obviously includes, as it says here, uh, I think it's 32 authority file systems. So that's actually a very valuable source for um, the extractor and the fusion process because we can begin to build um, a large set of entities, person entities, along with all their associated strings across all the authority files that currently feed into VOF. Next slide. So uh, just to sort of walk through what Bruce had uh, discussed earlier, um, as I mentioned, we have WorldCat, the Often Fast, our current data sources. Um, they all happen to be RDF um, marked up in schema.org, but an important part of this Knowledge Vault um, process is that those initial data sources actually don't have to be any standard data format, data vocabulary, data model, et cetera. I mean, this could just be HTML that we're scraping off the web. It could be uh, VRA XML data. It could be mods, mods XML data. Um, like I said, ours happens to be all consistent because it's all sort of internal data right now. Um, but in the extraction process, that's where you actually take this, um, I'll, I'm gonna call it unstructured data, although it, it would be very structured within its own sort of uh, uh, domain or, or data model. So we take that uh, unstructured quote unquote data um, extract it, and then not only add confidence scores to it, but more importantly, map it into a standard data model for the rest of the fusion process, for the fusion process as well as the, the end vault process. Um, our internal vocabulary that we use happens to be schema.org, um, but it could be a, a variety of others. It certainly doesn't matter which it is. Next slide. So, so then, as I just mentioned, once you go through this, through this extraction process, we then end up with these knowledge triples. Um, so 
Um, I guess taking a step back, those extractors could be just sort of generic, like sort of grab all the statements, it's already updated, grab all the statements you see and assign a confidence level to them. Um, but it can actually also be sort of very, very specific extractors, for example, name extractors or um, entity type extractors. So this sort of, this knowledge triple base here um, will be individual statements about statements. So basically you would have a, um, uh, a description of a statement, a subject or predicate and object, which Bruce mentioned earlier. Uh, the provenance associated with that statement, like where it came from, from example, the VOF data set, the WorldCat data set, the LCNAF data set, as well as the confidence level that we um, have associated with that. Um, in our experimentation, we've just been doing sort of a rudimentary um, confidence assignments, uh, so WorldCat data will have a, a blanket confidence associated with it, as will VOP, as will FAST, um, and as we talk about later, um, user input will also have an, a, a, just a generic confidence associated with it. So once we have those, that knowledge base, uh, this sort of the, this set of knowledge triples, it, then there's this fusion process, which is more or less just sort of pure statistical mathematics um, where you know, a variety of parameters can go into the fuser, um, but what you get at the end is a set of scored triples. Um, so as opposed to in the knowledge, the middle section, the, the knowledge base where you actually have sort of metadata about statements, the end result is actually just going to be a single statement with some sort of score associated with it. Um, and again, you can imagine these fusers being uh, sort of very generic. Uh, just take take the knowledge triples and pump them into a, a knowledge vault with scores. Or you can actually have a relatively fine-tuned fuser where you actually look at things like the provenance associated with the statement in the knowledge base. So, you know, a good example of, for this would be um, if for some reason a, a statement from uh, a local library was scored relatively low, but you have an application that that local library uses. So in essence, they really want the data that they've created to be very highly ranked. You could build in a fuser that looks at the provenance of the statement in the knowledge base, and then based on what that provenance is, either increases or decreases the end scored triple, or, or tunes or refines the end scored triple. So, um, so now we've gone over that sort of high level view again. Um, you know, if we start looking at the next few slides, we'll look at how we actually take our record-based world and turn it into uh, an entity-based graph. Um, so what we do here uh, at OCLC is start out with MARC records. Um, and then before you even get to the conversion into RDF, um, the MARC records go through an enhancement process. Uh, and there's a variety of uh, steps involved in that. Uh, the first one is fervor clustering, where we can take the, the large, the full set of workout records and cluster them based on work and manifestation. So all of our things in WorldCat, which are manifestation E, will point to a, a generic uh, related work. Um, the second step, which is uh, one of the most important in terms of converting it into RDF, is we're actually able to take um, strings that you might find in various mark fields, like a 600 field, a 650 field, and match them against existing data sets, such as VOF, FAST, LCSH, or LC vocabularies in general, and then actually in, insert an identifier into that mark record. Um, and this is really beneficial when we actually do the conversion, because what we do, what we use is an XSLT style sheet to convert this, uh, this mark XML data into RDF XML, which we can then reserialize as um, triples or whatever we want to for, um, uh, for production. And then that third, uh, that third statement there uh, is sort of related to the second one is add these identifiers. We're actually inserting these identifiers into the MARC record themselves. Um, in MARC XML, um, that's obviously just a different field. In, in traditional MARC, uh, in a MARC record, that becomes a subfield zero identifier field. So we then have this conversion process. Like I said, as I mentioned earlier, it's an XSLT style sheet conversion um, that takes these MARC records and actually will shred out of them 
um, bear a variety of entities. Uh, so here, these are the entities that we've identified uh, as being initially very important for bibliographic materials. Uh, they are persons, organizations, places, concepts, events, and, um, and works, which again goes back to the, uh, the fervor clustering that's done in the, the MARC enhancement. And then from there, uh, you then have triples. So you'll have a, a set of statements associated with a person, such as this person's name is John Smith. Um, based on how, how the MARC field is constructed, you can also have other statements like when they were born, when they died, things like that. Um, so then once we have these triples, um, like I said, this is where you can then start the knowledge vault process. You can start taking those, pumping those into the uh, knowledge base and then begin fusing them into sort of uh, a, a knowledge vault uh, data set. So what we're planning on doing is um, using this data that we are creating from the MARC records to uh, mock up and prototype end, end service applications that we can use to um, sort of demonstrate how you can visualize, discover, and search entities um, on the web. And at this point, I will turn it back over to uh, Bruce to talk a little bit about that prototype and TJS service. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, I haven't seen any questions on the chat at this point, and as we're rolling through this, uh, it's hard for, for me anyway to, to determine when I've used a sort of a conf confusing, opaque, jargony term. We've been trying to, to fill in some of the blanks on some of those as we go, but just in general, if there are questions, we'd be happy to pause at any point um, and tackle those. Jeff mentioned, and I had mentioned earlier this project we've called Entity JS. The name, the, we call it that because we're thinking about entities. The JS part of it stands for JavaScript. Uh, there is a set of software libraries that we're using for the client application and on the server that by convention a lot of them have JS at the end. So just to have a name to call it when we're talking about it internally, we call it Entity JS. Uh, it is just a research project, an experiment of ours. We're not intending this, we're not designing this or working on it as if it's a new product from OCLC, just how we're going to test this uh, knowledge vault that we're trying to create. Um, I'm going to stop before I wade into that uh, part of the demonstration because we did get a couple of questions I'd like to, to see if we could uh, to take on. Uh, Adam, you asked if uh, Knowledge Vault, is that a triple store? And if so, what software are you using to store the millions, billions of triples? Um, the Knowledge Vault as a term, from Google's perspective, it's really more of the overall process. But one component of it, at the end, you'll have a bunch of triples. And in our case, we do store those. We do have them in a triple store. Um, Jeff, maybe you'd want to talk a little bit more about that. In an earlier slide, we saw that transit from records to entities to triples in a set that we're testing with. We started with about 4 million records. When, when we derive entities out of those, we get about 40 million entities, and it goes up to roughly like 400 million triples. So there are lots of these little statements to, to store. Um, and Jeff, you'll remind me what we're using for storing them now. Yeah, so for the purposes of our prototype, uh, just because we're not working at, at scale in terms of working with all of WorldCat, uh, we're just using, um, uh, we were using Forstore, which is just an open source triple store, um, but um, th we also are using Jenna Fuseki, uh, which again is another open source triple store. Um, and for the purposes of our prototyping, um, those stacks are perfectly sufficient um, and scalable. Um, but looking at this in the, in the long term, when you need to start working with, as you mentioned, hundreds of millions, if not billions, of triples, um, there, there's a variety of other options that we've explored, such as using uh, HBase, uh, which is like a, a table-based architecture, um, as opposed to a triple store. Um, and then just building APIs that can query it the same way that um, that Sparkle can query a um, a triple store backend. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And Stephen, you had asked about uh, 
Ferber clusters, are they examined for internal consistency to assign confidence values to frequently occurring statements versus rare statements? And they, and they aren't at this point. Actually, confidence level assignment in the Google Vault sense isn't happening in our experiment as yet. That's of the many things we have yet still to tackle. We've basically given everything the same level of confidence when it's coming out of WorldCat, but we could do more. We and we that's that's uh, an important area for for us to investigate in this particular aspect of uh, the frequency of statements and or not is is uh, an important characteristic of that. And we do see, I suppose you could say that there's a a, a uh, representation of some of this type of examination that occurs when we do the string matching, when we find statements and records that we can match to to known vocabularies and assign standard identifiers. And there are a bunch of uncontrolled, undifferentiated headings that, that fall out, rarer or just problematic in terms of matching. But the general question about confidence values, that's as part of the vault work, that's, that's pending for us. That's a, a step we haven't yet taken. So back to this entity JS application. Uh, we wanted to have something that we could run in a browser and use RDF data basically as we find it. Try not to do too much with it. Not, no, no original code if we could help it. Just take off the shelf software to build this and try not to add too many magic tricks to hide any of the complexities that we may find in working with linked data. Because for us, it was an, a, a chance to see just how easy that is or difficult that is to do. Um, we wanted to search across the entities that we were creating when we derive them out of records, show relationships between them, and then think about some questions that would come up if you wanted to have a, uh, a way for users of this application to say more, to make additional relationships known to the system, to basically be another contributing data source for an extractor. Um, so that's that's basically what this application tries to do, and we're going to do a quick walkthrough of, of it. But before that, I'm going to go back back to the drawing board again to say, you know, we, we look at a more abstract model of working with the vault concepts for library data. I'm going to show you what we actually did, since it doesn't actually match the, uh, the abstraction. Um, there was a question from Melanie about the identifiers that we're adding in those enriched, enhanced WorldCat records in subfield zero. Uh, are they added in the form of URIs? And I believe they are. Is that true, Jeff? Yes, they are, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, in terms of that URI, will it be beneficial to differentiate the idea, the ID uh, of the real world object and essentially the lib authority record? Um, this this is a question that I I don't really get the the sense of it, Jeff. If you'd like to take a look at that, I'm going to step through some of the how we built the knowledge base, and then we can return to this one. Okay. 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 Well, so so we have we had our abstract view, and now here's the real world view. We wanted to look at WorldCat mark records. But we didn't necessarily want to look at all of them. Um, we took a subset. We call it the Archive Grid subset. If you're not familiar with Archive Grid, it's another OCLC research project uh, that that extracts from WorldCat records that describe the types of materials found in archival collections, primary source materials. There are about four million of these records that you can find in in WorldCat. I mean, that was a pretty good set. It also represented some special problems in the entities that would be derived from those records, and we wanted to tackle the special problems first instead of putting them up till later. That is, archival descriptions may represent the names of people and organizations that are not otherwise notable in our world. They haven't published anything, let's say. They're not found in VF. There aren't identifiers for them. What does it look like when you're dealing with entities that lack these identifiers where you're we have some difficulties perhaps in establishing relationships between them and would there be some opportunity for having the the system and its users contribute to the 
connections, of making connections between those entities. So archive grid, as a subset, about the right size and interesting in other ways. So we take that and we extract out of archive grid our knowledge triples. And the archive grid data, because it's based on enhanced WorldCat data, we've kind of already folded in the other two data sources that are familiar to us here at OCLC for working with RDF uh, linked data, that is VF and FAST. Those identifiers were already part of the enhanced mark record, so the extractor was able to quickly produce the knowledge triples that we wanted to, to work with for, for discovery in the knowledge vault. And at this point, because there's nothing else to fuse these with, there's no math to apply, there aren't any confidence levels to work with, they're essentially scored triples with all of the same score. They all go into our knowledge vault triple store as scored triples. But now they're there, what do you do to work with them? Well, we've built a client application and we built some services that could interact with this triple store. Uh, a way to look things up in the triple store. Uh, we extracted data out of this set using these uh, capabilities that run on a clustered computer, a Hadoop cluster. Uh, the technology or the, the programming method is called MapReduce, where you can quickly sift through large sets of data. And we use that to build indexes. We have an, an Elasticsearch index that lets us search across entities and find relationships between them. These are the steps we found we had to take to make the interaction with these score triples possible and performant at all in a, in a real world environment. So these, as we're doing this experiment, these would, I think, count as findings that anyone who's building a triple, a set of score triples like we are doing would probably find themselves grappling with similar problems. So we feel like this experiment might yield some interesting reference examples of how to get that work done. Once we have this application and it's looking at the knowledge vault, it can also look with the identifiers it finds in those triples, it can go look elsewhere. It can go back to WorldCat. It can go to VF and FAST and get full descriptions that are found in those resources. It can find from FAST uh, or from VF, it might have links to Wikidata or DBpedia or GeoNames or any other sources. The, this is where the power of linked data starts and those interoperable connections starts to really come into play. So we try to, to manifest some of that in this application as well. Um, Adam, you had asked about whether the library holdings are included in the knowledge vault, and they aren't right now, but I did put something into the application to go to look that up. Um, they, uh, there is only one holding, but which institution holds it is, is uh, something that we had to add in as a feature to the application. But it could have been. It's just another, uh, it's another triple. It's another thing to add to the connection between the resource and uh, it's a relationship of the resource to another known entity, which would be the institution. Should, uh, just to jump in real quick, um, I, I think that's a really good uh, question from Adam. And um, if we wanted to sort of input holdings into this current um, diagram we have here, I mean, that would uh, that'd be basically another piece of source information. Um, so you could imagine there's a WorldCat database that describes a thing, and then there's a holdings database that describes you know, who holds this item or these items, and that that can then also be pushed through the pipeline, and then in the end, back into that knowledge vault, what you would have is information from that holdings database. And that would be a good example of um, if we were to incorporate holdings ingesting through an extractor data that's not marked up in RDF. Right, so um, it's, a, it's one of our long list of things to get to. We had, we had, as I said, I put in some kind of feature so you can see who holds things, but that, that was something we had talked about doing, and I think it, it, it might be important to do this earlier in our, in our experiment than later, just to get a sense of how that, how that modeling works and what, how to depict it when we're talking about this, this process flow. One of the things we also wanted to do in this application I mentioned is let the user get involved. I see an app, I, I'm looking at an entity, for example, for, for a, uh, an organization, and the data that I'm looking at suggests that uh, it came from FAST, but it has a name, it has a string at least that I could search in some other resource, so I do a search, and Wikidata 
and I find that there are a bunch of other things that look like it's the same organization. And so there's an article in Wikipedia describing this organization. I like to make that connection. I like to make what we would call a same as connection. So we build a feature into the system to let me do that, to sift through that list and claim that this thing described by this fast identifier is the same as this thing described by this Wikidata identifier, and put that back into the application so that others can see it. So that's what this application triples box is in this slide. It just contributes uh, a new relationship back into the, the vault. But you can see in this arrow, it's only going back into our vault services. So that only NTTJS can see that, that claim. But it's important for those claims to go somewhere else. And in this case, NTTJS becomes a new kind of uh, data source with its own extractor. It creates its own knowledge triples, and here now finally we have something for the fusers to do. We have two different sources of data, two different extractors, two different confidence levels at least from sources, and we can try to assess how those come into play when we're trying to, to work with those score triples in an application. That's the stuff we haven't gotten to yet, but we're just about there. We've created the step of actually of producing the new triples. We just haven't done anything yet to try to fuse them. We, I mentioned these vault services. Um, Jeff, do you want to talk through this slide? This is, these are the things we put into place so that we can interact with the triple store and create these application triples. Yeah, so basically these, uh, this, this vault services are sort of APIs to interact with the vault uh, as well as go off and query outside data sources. Um, so the most important vault service we have is, um, as Bruce mentioned, we use Elasticsearch as an uh, index backend. Um, so we actually are never actually directly, uh, in terms of searching, directly querying the triple store, just because it would be a, a very expensive regular expression Sparkle query, which simply doesn't scale well. So um, as I mentioned, the most important vault service is taking a, a, a string query from a user, going off to Elasticsearch to conduct a query for it, pulling back the results, and then routing those results to the triple store as a Sparkle describe query. So um, it should be important, it's important to note that, that Elasticsearch backend, um, the index only has an identifier for the entity and then string labels for it. So basically we're not caching any RDF fish data into the Elasticsearch index. So it can only be used for string querying to find an entity, at which point the application then needs to go off to a triple store or to uh, DBpedia or FAST or VOF to actually get any information about that entity. Um, and then the, uh, the other APIs that we've built are, are basically canned Sparkle queries um, that uh, prevent the user from actually having direct access to the triple store just for the purposes of um, you know ensuring that unanswerable questions aren't asked and it's basically a performance type of um, uh, concern and then uh, the, the last thing is there's uh, we've been able to integrate this sort of page rankness to the entities so when we started out with the worldcat data and uh, then shredded all the records as we were shredding those records we were actually keeping a count the number of times entities appeared in records. So for the um, archive grid subset, we initially experimented with a basic a subset of that subset, which was archive grid records that had a subject heading of American Civil War. So when we took that subset and then added page rank to all of the entities, uh, it was actually very intuitive when you're doing a search across persons that Abraham Lincoln would be the very first person to, that you'd find if you started typing in L-I-N-C. Um, so what we're actually able to do is sort of what, what basically what Google does is page rank um, our entities based on, the number, based on the number of times they link to things and conversely the, time, the number of times things link to them. Um, and as we look uh, at sort of the live demo here um, in a few minutes, you'll see how, um, how, how well and intuitive that works, or that is, and how well it works. And uh, we'll uh, take a, a, just a brief pause here before 
uh, trying that, that demonstration. Uh, Jackie, I got a clear idea of your question. I don't know that we'll have a, a better way to, to answer it, though. This work that we're doing with, uh, considering to do with fusion and the fusion step for creating score triples, as I mentioned, we haven't really gotten to that point that yet, but you had asked um, about the differentiating process, how to achieve that for um, uh, the real world object or the authority ID. How are we going to contend with making assessments and scoring? If you look at the Google Vault papers, as Jeff had mentioned, that step is pure math. You do need properties associated with the triples that you create in your knowledge triple store, where they came from, their provenance, confidence levels, et cetera, all enter into the, basically into the math that's involved. But we haven't really taken that step yet with any of this data. So, so I think we'll have a better way to answer your question about what our process looks like, how we, how we approached it, how much of that actually, the math from the Google perspective, where they're dealing with different kinds of data and much more of it, how much of that really applied in our world when we've gotten a little further along in this experimental, uh, experimental work. But Jeff, if you have, a, you likely would have a better answer than, than I'm giving to that question at this, at this stage, as we're considering the, the fusion process, but haven't actually carried it out. Yeah, so, so as it stands now, um, almost all of the data that we're using internally, whether it be VOF fast or the WorldCat data, points is either modeled as real world objects um, and or points to real world objects. Um, the the outliers there being if we have a world cat record that we've enhanced to point to an LC thing, which might be cl classified as a, a SCOS concept. Um, but even with that, uh, we're going to have a, a VOF entity or an OCLC persons entity, which were which is in the pipeline to be released here in a few months. Um, that will sort of uh, supersede that SCOS concept thing from, um, you know, name your uh, current authority file. So, um, as Bruce mentioned, I just don't, I don't think we've really encountered that yet in terms of how the fusing process will work with it, um, simply because during our prototype services, uh, prototype um, work, almost all of the entities we're working with are real world objects. So I'm going to attempt a, a live demo, but uh, Stephen, you had mentioned that my audio has been breaking up. I'm not sure what to do about that. I'm talking into the microphone. <laughs> and I think I'm not breaking up here, but it's happening somewhere in between. Um, so Jeff, if you don't mind talking through this, I'm going to try, um, try a live demo, but kind of following along uh, a sketch of what we had uh, expected to do. I'm going to attempt to You're getting reassurance that you sound OK. So. Oh, great. Maybe, maybe you're... There's nothing I can of. do about my leftover, whiny, Western New York accent, but the, <laughs> the rest of the quality, I think, hopefully it was getting better. Um, so if um, others watching chat or others can see, tell me whether you can see this, this screen, I'm sharing my screen. That's good. As Jeff mentioned, we wanted this search experience to not only Thanks, Adam, for letting us know. The, uh, for the search experience to be responsive and also to bring to the top things that are of interest. I'm looking at, again, it's archive grid data, but even in this case, I've selected a somewhat smaller subset of it for this demonstration. These are the archive grid records that have something to do with the American Civil War. We found that set by taking the four million archive grid records and getting all of the collection records that matched the uh, fast heading for the Civil War. So I typed in LANC. You'd expect Abraham Lincoln to surface near the top of the search result, and he does as a person. Other organizations, concepts, et cetera, start to show up again with just string matching. So North Lincolnton, North Carolina, the Lincoln Douglas debates as an event. The six entity types that we talked about show up side by side in a, in a quick search result. I'm going to choose Robert Todd Lincoln from the list. And at this point, I've gone off to, to VF to get the VF record and have done some other things to see what what our triples, what our score triples, our triple store and the relationships within it know about this entity and what other 
what other uh, linked data resources can tell me about this entity. So just briefly, in this entity view for Robert Todd Lincoln, uh, there's some information about, about him. When he was born, when he died, his role, some of this is coming from Wiki data, including these family relationships, his father Abraham, his mother Mary Todd. Related works, these come out of the archive grid subset, the works that mention Robert Todd Lincoln as a creator or as a contributor or as a subject. Related media coming from Wikimedia Commons because there was a, a Wikidata link in the, the VF record. Related people, these are the top people who occurred in other archive descriptions that mention Robert Todd Lincoln. And as Jeff had mentioned, we tried to do something page, page rank like in the, in the ordering of these people, not just like an alphabetical list of them all, but the ones that occur the most as a way to getting kind of a weight, a strength, or weakness to that, that bond or that relationship that's depicted on this card. You might be, wonder why some of the headings are showing up in gray and others are in blue, and it isn't uh, a nod to the Civil War. It's just the gray headings represent entities in our world. We don't have yet a standard identifier for this, so we just kind of create one associated with the work. I'm looking at uh, a related event, the China Relief Expedition. That was an undifferentiated heading. It's just identifiable as a string, as a kind of an event in the MARC record, but we didn't have an identifier that we could create for it. So we looked at the work that's associated with it, created a string, uh, a dereferenceable string as a sort of a hash URI, and created a new identifier for this guy. So that's just a way for us to see at a glance which ones of these were the uh, temporary hash URIs that were created for these entities and which ones have a, a standard identifier. Jeff, you can please feel free to jump in here too if, uh, if I'm missing something that I should be talking about in this, uh, in this tour. Yeah, the only thing uh, worth noting is with the, um, the page rank for the related entities, um, what we did for that was um, it was it's sort of an indirect weight that we assigned, and it was basically the number of WorldCat records in which both the current entity you're looking at and the other entity are referenced together. Um, so one of the things we'd be interested in doing in the future is being able to allow uh, user feedback to actually say um, what that relationship is. So. Um, if, uh, if Bruce, if you were to scroll down, I think uh, Robert Todd Lincoln was um, related um, to um, Ulysses S. Grant. Um, it'd be interesting to know exactly what that relationship right is. Um, right now, all we can, all we're able to derive is that these are related entities in that they appeared uh, in the same WorldCat record. Um, so they're common subjects of a creative work or something like that. But there's obviously um, a much more uh, granular relationship that either um, uh, a cataloger could provide to us or even a, a domain expert within the realm of the Civil War would be able to tell us. So what we're hoping to do is build sort of a, um, an enhancement um, interface akin to the uh, Linked Jazz project that was run out of uh, Pratt. I wanted to see if I could uh, demonstrate this user contributed content, that same as relationship that I talked about. This is a fast heading for Vicksburg, Mississippi. And from that fast record, we can make the other connections to related works and places and organizations to the work data. Um, but we might also be able to look at uh, another resource. So the fast record doesn't have a link, a Wikidata, Wikipedia identifier in it. So we just do a search for Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, and here's a, a link to that location. So I can suggest that this is a match. I'm gonna click on that. And it goes off to Wikidata and finds, uh, finds a connection. Um, it can also go off to DBpedia when it's responding and get additional data including images and so forth. So this is now a, a relationship that I've added to the record. And I was actually logged in. We used Google 
uh, sign in for this. So I'm logged in. It knows that I uh, made this connection. This is now it's a new kind of statement, a same as relationship to store not only in the application so other people can see that this is related to this Wikidata source, but it also could flow back into the library vault process. It could be with some confidence associated with it, a new claim, a new kind of statement that there's the same as relationship between these two identifiers. So it's a, a small step in the direction of testing user contributed content, but it also gives us a way to, to have some more input that we might be able to then test in the fusion step when we get a little bit further along in that process. I just wanted to mention really quickly, uh, you, so we've been saying uh, building same as relationships and, and for those of you who are, who are uh, very familiar with uh, linked data RDF, we're not using owl same as, uh, which is a very strict, confined sort of ontological binding between two things. We're actually using uh, schema.org's same as property, which is um, slightly more fuzzy in terms of what um, the subject and the object are in that triple. So uh, within the framework of, of the schema.org vocabulary, it would actually be going back to that question about real world objects and um, identifiers. Um, although odd, it would be okay to say that this LCNAF person header ident identifier is the same as this VOF real-world object. Uh, we wouldn't do that because uh, it would cause problems later on in our in the pipeline process. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that we're not actually declaring these things as an OWL same as relationship. So we are kind of winding down our hour with you and I wanted to make sure there was even more time for questions. There was really only one more slide to return to just to emphasize where we are in the in the process. So if I can get back to my slide deck here, skip over the slides I had just in case I couldn't get a demo to work. Um, this slide, this is this last step here where we have opportunities to test an end-to-end -end test of the knowledge vault, which we hadn't really gotten to because we need to be able to, to really truly test this. We need to do something with, with the vault uh, process that has fusion involved instead of just taking all our triples and treating them all the same. Um, Adam, you had asked about the knowledge base, uh, Google, what people are searching for and how often. Uh, uh, as another kind of ranking and confidence and importance, that's a really interesting idea. I and mean, we do have, have a lot of that data um, from, from varied, varied sources too. Some of it might be targeted into certain kinds of use the users of the search API as opposed to users of worldcat.org, the discovery system as opposed to worldcat local, and there are ways to, to think about how we might sift through that data and use it as, as another sort of attribute of visibility, interest, and importance of, uh, of something that's been found. It's, it's when it, especially when it can be described as intentional data, as not just something that happened as part of some other process. Um, uh, I don't think, Jeff, I can't recall we've ever, ever talked about that, um, that using that, that user, user data, search data as part of this flow, that it strikes me as another interesting opportunity to try to fold into the experiment. And um, Stephen asked about the, the, the errors. There are errors. Uh, we all have to contend with them. Google certainly does. We do as well. That will produce these erroneous triples. We talked about that in the, as a kind of step in refinement. That I don't know how this would scale, but at least you could experiment with getting getting the data exposed, maybe give people a chance to to either add to, refine, delete, or correct. You saw that a little bit in the refinement of a same as relationship. And as soon as it was in the system in the entity JS application, it gave others a chance to say, no, remove that. Somebody contributed this, but it's wrong. So those are all claims, they're all statements, they all get into the pipeline. We've been thinking about that a little bit. I'm going to, I think I might have a slide somewhere way in the back here for some of that entity refinement. Um, if this isn't quite what you're asking about, but we have for the Battle of Antietam or Sharksburg, depending on what side of the conflict you were on, we'll have identifiers for those. And then through looking up in Wikidata, lots of other or strings representing that same thing, that battle, that event. 
we'll find strings, though, that we haven't been able to differentiate. They, they're not exactly all of them errors, although the Battle of Antietam from 1962 probably is <laughs> an error. There's a correction that could be made. Even if you tried to convert that into a triple, you'd have an erroneous statement. And it's going to service, as we know. It, it, they can run, but they can't hide these errors. So when they do, what do you do about that? How do you contend with that? How do you allow for those to be at least marked for correction, and then we we're talking about a triple store that we've created here at OCLC. What does that mean for the, the initial data source, whatever it might have been? We think about it as being WorldCat, but it's really not. It's some other contributing institution to WorldCat. How do you reflect those changes all the way back to their initial source? Um, so these are really interesting questions, I think. Uh, I, we have no answers, <laughs> but they're, they, they occupy us anyway. So we, this is something that came up just very briefly. I know we're out of time here, but somebody, an archive grid user, I watch over that system, and she asked this question. She was basically making an observation that this person was her father and passed away on July 3rd, 2013. The record has, um, has an indication of the, the creator of these sketches of the person and their birth date, but without a death date, and they presumably wanted us to update the record. I, well, this came, this is a record from the Fashion Institute of Technology. Um, they could make that correction, but really it's, it's, then the question is, well, where should this information actually go? Because the authoritative form of this person's name doesn't have any dates, as the name authority rules would be for, for LC. It's just for, in this case, this particular record had a birth date, but Normally, you wouldn't have birth and death dates, you, but you could if you had a wiki data page for this person. So maybe that's where this change gets recorded and gets then folded back into the into the vault. So all pretty captivating work. We're interested in any other reactions we might get from this presentation and others. Um, and uh, and thanks, Adam, for the for the citation for that other research paper on machine learning. The the work that's happening at Google and elsewhere is a not just a backdrop to what we're doing, but we're really trying to be active in that and trying to test some of the same ideas in, in the data that we're grappling with as well. And we'll be, as we go forward with this experiments, we have further along, we'll be forthcoming with our findings and sharing what we what we know. We are now about out of time. And yeah. thanks again for the for the time with us. So we really appreciate it. Yeah, so thanks so much for your um for your not only your attendance but also your participation. You were an extremely uh engaged group and we always appreciate that. Uh as I mentioned at the outset, we'll be posting a recording of the webinar and also the slides and we'll let you know by email uh when that is is available and you can uh rewatch and also hope that you share with friends. And a brief mention, uh, Bruce and Jeff will be attending the Society of American Archivists meeting and will be um, presenting on this work at the research forum there and will also be available to um, talk about this. So if you have colleagues who are attending that meeting, please uh, send them our way. Uh, thanks again for, for attending and we'll see you next